All right, it's time for another part to the public land mature buck bedding series. Been wanting to take you into this spot for a while. Hardly anybody ever goes into this spot. In fact, I've run trail cameras in this general vicinity for years, and I've never seen a hunter in here. This property, uh, I love it because it's got a lot of swamp land in it. And if you can see behind me, you get a lot of this where it's wet ground. These areas that you can sink into usually your waist, even though there's trees growing around if you're not careful. And so right away that eliminates a lot of people hunting this, this property. And so you have a lot of water on this property and because of that, it holds a lot of deer, even though it's highly pressured. The pressured areas tend to be spots where you can get into easily and the places where people can walk right in on a dry land location. And that's almost always true for just about every spot that you hunt public land wise. And so if you want to get a mature buck on a highly pressured property, you're probably going to have to go at it by looking in the spots that most people aren't willing to go. And that's certainly true of this spot I'm taking you into today. I call this the rim swamp buck bed. And that's because in almost every single swamp that I've hunted, there are these places where you have the last series of decently tall vegetation. I'm not talking about red dogwoods and some of the lower growing shrubs. I'm talking about the smallest trees that are still able to grow. Sometimes it's conifers, other times it might be larch or some other water loving species, but no matter, it tends to stand out a little bit higher than shrubs do. And I think that this becomes a beacon for the deer to actually navigate. They actually use this as a place for them to hone in on and pass through as they're going from one place to another. I've managed to have, I bet, at least a dozen mature buck encounters in this real specific spot. I'll show you what the rim looks like when we get there, but it's not very long, maybe 50 yards long and only maybe 20 or so feet wide in most locations. But that spot has probably been the best spot anywhere on public land that I've ever hunted. And there are, I believe, three reasons why this rim is so good. One, it's just plain old hard to get there. It's not like it's miles and miles back in, though it does take quite a bit of time to get there. Usually when I'm going through the really thick stuff that's on this property, I usually allow myself two hours to get into this spot cleanly. You can hoof it in there in about 20 minutes, but everything will hear you from 500 yards away because it is so loud going through the underbrush. The second reason is because of the pressure that exists. So I'll show you in a moment one of the stands that exists on one of the points. And for sure, it's a great spot. On a private piece of property, this would be a prime location for a stand. And I'm not saying somebody can't shoot a buck out of it, but most of the mature bucks are not coming to this spot during daylight. They're for sure eating these swamp white oak acorns, but they're not coming up there during hunting season because if they do, they're gonna get popped. And that point that goes out into this swamp, and there's actually a series of swamps, I would say, is one of five or six ladder stands that exist on this property. Now in Pennsylvania, you're supposed to take down your stand a couple of weeks after the deer season ends. But these stands have been there permanently since I first discovered them at least six years ago. I, when I scout, not only look for deer, but where are the hunters going? Because that helps to indicate where I'm gonna find the most mature deer. And that's certainly true of this spot. The third reason that I find bucks in this location and big ones is because of the rut. There are a lot of doe bedding areas and the real thick stuff around it. 
and these bucks will move into this spot. I hardly ever see the big ones before October 20th, but from October 20th all the way through the end of late season, which in Pennsylvania is almost to the end of January, usually January 20th or so, I see consistent big buck rutting action in here. Of course, the lion's share of it is from October 20th till about November 20th or so, but I'll see bucks actively investigating rut sounds, the clanking of antlers, the estrus bleat, even other bucks all the way through till season goes out in January. So this becomes a spot that for three months out of the year, mature bucks seem to use, but the rest of the time they may come through in transition, but they're hardly ever in this spot uh, the rest of the year. So these are all swamp white oak trees. And while not every year they produce, it's a pretty good hard mast location. And it's the end of this point that goes out into the swamp. And as I said, there's a ladder stand right here on this point. And it's been here, oh, at least six years, probably longer. So this helps to determine the pressure that the deer feel. And it helps to push the deer out onto this rim that I've talked about. Let me take you into the rim. So you got all these little bedding kind of areas like this. And the deer can hole up in there and hardly be seen. I mean, this is the least amount of cover that they have any time during the year in the winter. And you can see their beds and how well they can hide despite there's no foliage on these shrubs. So you've got a lot of these spots in this swamp, and I find this true in a lot of swamps in Pennsylvania where I live, where there are what I call swales. Warm season grasses, sometimes they flood. Right now you can probably see that there's ice frozen in the middle of these swales, but they can be anywhere from five feet wide to in some cases maybe 40, 50 yards wide. And the deer will sometimes bed in these, but more frequently they'll be found on these tiny little hummocks that are just a little bit higher off of the swale. It enables them to have a quick out if they need to get out of the spot. They also have easy access to move about, but it also gives them a really good place to be secluded. I'll show you one of these doe beds right here. There's actually a couple of beds in here for a doe family group to bed in. Right here is a perfect example. So you got the swale out here. And you can see it's beat down here. And that's because down in here is that bed. It's hard to see with the vegetation right now. That's worn down to the ground. Again, a swale here. And look at this bed right in here. And we haven't even gotten to the prime mature buck bedding areas. That's a huge bed. That could very well be a buck. I'd be negligent if I didn't tell you that in these spots, when you get into a swamp, you really need to be careful. Someday I'll tell the story of almost dying in a swamp, but it's a real danger. There's a reason most people don't cross water, and there's a reason why it's hard to get into these spots and while there are big bucks here, because it's not a place that you can just go in willy-nilly without any preparation. Scouting is really really essential in these kinds of setups because as much as I need to know where the deer are it's equally important for me to be able to know where I can get in because there are so few places to be able to navigate through the thick stuff that I scout that as much as I do the deer. So be really careful. There are places where you can plunge through 
what is like floating bog or this really thick muck. It's almost always dark in color, real deep brown or even a black color that you can sink in right up to your neck. And not only do you have to worry about drowning, but hypothermia is a really real deal. So here is what I call the rim. And you can see in this case, it's made up of a series of alder and willow trees, mostly pussy willow. And for sure, all around this area, for hundreds of acres, there are spots where you'll find big bucks bedded. It's just almost impossible to hunt them because it's so thick. There's no spot for you to be able to get into quietly. And furthermore, there's no way to get off a shot. If you don't have a shot, it's not a good place to be hunting. And what ends up happening is, although this area can flood occasionally, and some areas actually have water in it year round, you definitely need boots to get into this spot. There's these areas that are just higher than the other areas around it. And because they're up out of the water all the time, in this case, it's a magnet for deer, especially big bucks. It's really hard to get in here and be quiet. So you have to come in, as I said before, really slowly. And there's also, you'll probably notice, an absence of any place that you could put up a tree stand. So this ends up becoming ground-to-ground -ground combat. The good thing about it is I know you can be successful doing it because I've killed most of my deer on the ground. And furthermore, I've gotten really close to killing multiple mature bucks in this spot. If you've hunted long, you know what it's like to get really close. Sometimes just a couple of yards or feet or even inches away from making it happen. But that's what makes hunting exciting because just seeing a big buck, even getting close to it, doesn't mean that you actually get a shot off. All right, I'm gonna take you into this spot. I'll walk you through. In the past, I think I've probably shown you five examples of mature public land buck beds. And those were almost every one of them, a very specific bed, the dominant bed that that buck's in. In this case, it's more of an area, but it's very linear because this rim, as I call it, just kind of is like a thread of ribbon through the swamp. And it's not very long, which usually makes it so that you know where the buck is. But getting him to come out, that's a whole nother ball game. All throughout this rim, you'll see spots like this, where there are trails that go through. And right there is one of the buck beds. This is actually one of the more worn down beds. All right, so as we get in here, pretty much where you see water, with the exception of that big area there, but most of these spots, those are just big trails that the bucks and does, for that matter, navigate through here. And notice, this tree right here, probably not even 20 feet tall. That's a pussy willow tree. And these are alder trees. Notice they're distinctive little cone-like seed pods. And that's their, that long tubular piece there. That's where their pollen, their male pollen comes from. And this certainly isn't a new spot for bucks. You can see that old historical scar from a rub. Same with over here. Over here we've got some more and we've got some from this year. Here's one of the nicer buck beds in here. And somebody was definitely home this year. Look at those rubs in there. You might notice all the red in this video right here. And that's because interspersed on this rim is a whole bunch of red dogwood, which means bucks can hole up in here and they don't even have to leave because they can get their food. They can have their needs met from a breeding standpoint. 
and they have a secluded place to get away from the pressure of all the hunters that are out. There's a nice fresh rub and a small one down there. Just about everywhere you look in here there are rubs though. I still kind of marvel at the fact that I haven't been successful in this spot yet. Although it's come down to a matter of inches and feet a couple of times. I'm eventually going to win the battle. Alright, so I'll show you maybe two more beds in here. I think you've kind of got the idea of what it looks like. Alright, so here's the bedroom. And here's a specific bed right here. And oftentimes I'll find that the bucks are stacked up on this edge of the rim because there's a swale out here. I don't know if you can see the light area out there, but oftentimes the does will cross those areas and they can smell really well during the rut. All right, here's another bed. It's right down here. That one hasn't been used as much, but again, they're setting themselves up for success. Protection from their predators and hunters and a good access for nearby doe bedding. If you can see the light areas there, that's one of the swales off of this rim. Gives them an ability to get out onto that deer highway, so to speak, really quickly. If they have to, they can move around if they smell hot doe. It's a perfect spot in so many ways. And these rims are fairly easy to find when you have boots on the ground. All you do is walk the transition between usually the woodland and where it meets the wet. But, and then you're looking for the last series of vegetation. But they often don't show up on aerial maps very well because the trees are hardly distinct from the shrubbery around it. The shrubs here may be 10 feet, even 15 or 20 feet tall especially the nannyberry viburnum, that can grow up to 20 feet tall, and most of what's in here is 20 feet or less. That right there, that's four feet off the ground. That's not a tiny buck. So one of the last things that I wanted to mention about this spot that makes it difficult to hunt is that in large part there's no terrain here to affect the wind and yet the thermals play havoc on your scent all the time. You can actually go on the weather channel or whatever your favorite weather source is and it may say that the wind's blowing out of the west at 8 miles an hour. You come down into this rim and it's blowing out of the east. Or it may be out of the north. And so it makes it really challenging. If you're not throwing a wind indicator like milkweed, you're probably giving yourself up. And just because you don't see a big buck on your hunt doesn't mean there's not one in there. And you certainly don't want to educate them to the fact that you're close by. Certainly, you know, the actual coming down into this spot I usually reserve for hunts only and when I'm making a special video for you guys. So I'd like to mention a little bit about one of the theories that I have about how these swamp rims develop. And my theory is that at least in the very best swamp rims that I've found they're actually ancient beaver dams that have been abandoned and after a number of years that wood and mud that makes up the beaver dam, it deteriorates and birds and some small mammals will bring seeds in. And the next thing you know, you've got larger trees, not big ones obviously, the ones that I've been talking about, alders and pussy willows and, or maybe larch or some other kind of conifer, start to grow and then you have these, these rims that exist. These swamp rims are generally different than traditional swamp islands or points because there's not as much geographic location and because of that big trees can't grow. And furthermore it seems like these swamp rims are almost always very linear 
in their orientation. And just about everyone that I can think of runs parallel to the stream that runs through that particular swamp. Every swamp usually has as its base a stream or a river that goes through it. And because the elevation doesn't change very much, it usually meanders and water will accumulate in that area. These swamp rims seem to be parallel to that where a feeder stream into the main stream would have existed. And in this swamp rim that I'm showing you, you can actually see where the stream, I believe, has been diverted around the beaver dam. Probably took quite a bit of time for that to take place, but eventually these develop. And so it's kind of neat to think about the fact that someone like maybe my grandfather 30 years ago would have known this area as a beaver dam. And today it's a swamp rim. So how in the world do you hunt a mature rim buck? Well, first of all, if you're putting yourself in the position of going to the rim, you've already outdone 90% of the hunters. Most people won't cross over the water and the swampy land. They don't like the instability of it. And even those who know that swamps are beacons for big bucks, many of them will go as far as one of those points that juts out into the swamp, but they won't actually go into the swamp itself. And that's because there's not a spot that you can put a tree stand. And so if you put yourself in that location, just about anything can happen. That's not to say that there's not more proven strategies. I'll tell you about three ways that have worked for me over the last number of years, and everything has come together perfectly except being able to release an arrow. So the first method has to do with the spot that I'm standing in right now. In this spot, there are a number of hawthorn trees and a little bit bigger trees than what's out on the rim, but this is about 100 to 150 yards away from the rim. But it's the first real dry ground that is in this area. If you can find at least one of the primary scrapes that are associated with a rim. I've never found a scrape on that rim. I think part of that is because it's mostly a buck haven and that's not where they communicate with the does. But they do communicate with the does in this location. So if you spend a lot of time, and it took me a couple of years to put this all together, you may just find a primary scrape. And this scrape there's usually a series of them, but one is a, a big one, and it is actually used throughout the year. It's underneath a hawthorn tree. And so that scrape, you can do one of two things. You can set up right near that scrape, getting bucks coming off the rim, or perhaps better, split the difference and set yourself up out in the swamp between the rim and the scrape on the most likely trail that a big buck will be taking to get to that scrape. On this public piece of property in this specific location, I'm going to have to set up on the ground. There's no way around that. So figuring out where are things best set up for me to be successful are really critical. Perhaps on one day, I wanna be halfway between the rim and this scrape because the wind and the thermals and perhaps what I'm finding on my trail cameras and my latest intel tells me that that's where I should be. And on another day, I may come in and set up near the scrape because that's what makes the most sense. You have to make these really detailed decisions based upon the nitty gritty information that's taking place on that day. I don't ever wanna go, I'm gonna set up in that one spot because, well, the big bucks usually are on to you if you've been in that spot just one time. And furthermore, the conditions change on a micro level all the time. No one situation is ever the same as the previous. I like to have the flexibility to set up where I feel comfortable, usually with a crosswind and the thermals not creating all kinds of havoc. Another way to go about hunting one of these rim bucks is to set up 
really close to the rim itself out on one of the swales. And the best case scenario is to pick out a spot where perhaps two swales come together. Oftentimes they'll create a nearly perpendicular intersection. And that way you up your odds on catching a buck that's cruising through those areas. Of course, you're going to want to make sure that you're leaving allowance and observing the trails that exist that cut between these swales, oftentimes in this scenario through red dogwood and various kinds of viburnum and, and swamp rose and other forms of wet loving vegetation. If you set up on one of these trails, you just might have a buck come right in on you, but he's coming directly toward you, which doesn't afford a really good ethical shot. I never take frontal shots. It's not a high percentage chance. I know some people do, but for me, it's not worth the risk of wounding an animal. And yes, I've had big bucks come into four yards away where I could have shot frontally and I've chosen not to because I don't feel like it's a fair shot. That's up to you, but the important thing is to make sure in this situation that you're taking into account these cutoff trails between the swales so that you aren't going to be busted by a buck before you can draw back and release an arrow. The best scenario that I've found is if you can get yourself back off of that swale which is the big opening with warm season grasses in it, at least five yards. A buck that's cruising in the direction that that swale mainly goes will offer you a broadside shot. If you set up right on the edge of that swale, you're most likely going to get busted with that slight movement of you pulling back on your bow. The best scenario for me is to find a small patch of warm season grasses that are off of the main swale itself. That way I don't have to shoot through a bunch of dogwood and viburnum and other spindly shrubs that can deflect an arrow easily. I can just set up right in that grass and I don't have to worry about destroying vegetation. I might highly recommend to you that you also consider taking a small stool in with you one of those fold-up stools that people carry when they go backpacking or camping, a stool that can fold up into perhaps a small cylinder and be carried really easily in your pack. The reason I suggest this is if you are going to go into one of these spots for even four hours, it is really challenging to set up on the ground itself. I usually carry a pad with me and I'll kneel on that but as I get older, it becomes more and more difficult to do that long term. And so being able to have a little stool, you're going to be hidden because it's probably going to be a really thick area. And then make sure that you've been practicing shooting from a sitting position rather than a standing position. Of course, you might be able to stand up, but you also might not. So being able to be versatile in your shooting ability helps to up the odds that you can actually get off a shot. The third tactic that I've used effectively is to hunt this spot during the main part of the rut. The chase as it leads up to the rut itself and then when most of the breeding is actually taking place, bucks will check back into this area looking for a new hot doe. I've used three strategies during the rut in this rim area and other rim areas for that matter effectively. The first one is just a straight up buck grunt use a grunt tube and you're calling to another buck as though you're challenging that buck. I don't get real aggressive. I have what I consider the happy medium between a contact grunt, which is the hello grunt where most deer will just grunt. You'll hear this a lot of times when they're moving at night. They just want to have a, their feelers out to know where the other deer are. And uh, a challenging grunt as though a buck is actually trying to take on another buck. I try to use a mature grunt sound, but not be overly aggressive with it. And a lot of times those big bucks will come in to see what's going on. Does that other buck have a doe? And is it possible to maybe chase him off? I've also used an estrus bleat or can to be able to call during the rut. And that oftentimes is like a, a home run or a strikeout. Sometimes it doesn't work at all, but other times they come in on a string. So be ready 
if you do that, to have action immediately. I mean, you need to be able to think about where you're going to put your can or your grunt tube as soon as you're done with making that sound because the deer can come that quick. Sometimes I'll mix it up and I'll actually have the estrus bleed along with a, a mature buck grunt from the tube and I'll try to make sounds that uh, represent a buck tending a doe. And the third way that I've used effectively on this rim is to have a pair of antlers with me and I will do some rattling. And one of the great advantages about being on the ground and hunting from the ground is that you can sound much more realistic in your calling and in your rattling. Deer are so good at picking out where something is that if you're 20 feet up in a tree, it's not that rattling and grunting doesn't work there, but a lot of times with the big mature bucks, it sounds really genuine when it's coming from the ground. So I try to mix this up where I'm not just rattling the antlers, I'm also using the different sounds of what a real buck fight would sound like. So I'm stomping in on the ground, I am brushing up against vegetation. I'm making sure though that I'm not getting my hunting clothes if they're made of some kind of synthetic material that's going to make that terrible, awful sound that deer know is not natural. I wanna make sure that all the sounds I'm making are natural. A lot of times having a big stick or using one of those antlers to brush against uh, dogwood or viburnum or even the ground, those are really effective ways to pique the curiosity of a mature buck. There's so much more that could be said about hunting these mature bucks in swamp rims. But let me just say this because I think it's really critical. You may watch this video and go, wow, that's easy. You know, go in, find yourself a swamp rim. Most people aren't willing to go there, but I am. I'm willing to hoof it in there. I'm willing to go in and, and take two hours to weasel my way through so that I get in a spot where I'm undetected. But nothing could be further from the truth. A lot of times when you hunt these rims, you will not see a single deer. And you have to be okay with the fact that you may not see any deer at all. But if you do see a deer, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be a mature buck. It may even be the biggest buck you've ever seen. I talk to other hunters all the time who say, man, I saw 20 or 30 or even 40 deer today. I hardly ever have days like that because I'm not setting up in spots where I want to see a lot of deer. I'm setting up in spots where I can see, perhaps, at least put myself in the game of seeing a mature buck. And that's usually going to drop the number of deer that you see. So when you go in one or two or three or even 10 times to a rim and you still haven't been able to kill a mature buck, recognize that it's not just a perfect equation. You're usually set up in what I call micro hunting spots. And what I mean by this is in these swamps, the area that you are hunting in you can actually divvy it up into maybe like 50 little chunks and it may not even be a gigantic swamp. And you may be able to hunt one that's on the west side and then one on the east side and one on the north and then one on the south and not really do a lot of damage to that hunting spot. You have all these little micro locations that if you're one swale over, which may only be 25 yards, but it's too far for you to be able to shoot because of all the vegetation between you and hearing that buck slop his way through the muck. So breaking up one of these rim areas and the swales around it, the vegetation, however it is in your part of the country, is really critical to having success. And when it all comes together, when you have a mature buck right there in front of you, and you see how big one of these deer can actually get on a piece of public land that has dozens of ladder stands. Not more than a couple of hundred yards away, but they might as well be a mile away. It's a really cool feeling. I hope you'll consider sharing this with your hunting buddies and if you haven't subscribed please do so so you can always see the videos that are coming out. I am committed um, at this point to trying to put out a video on a regular basis here as I've been working on accumulating as much video material as possible so that I can do that consistently.
Until next time, I'm Daryl with Seeds to Dreams Deer, and I hope that you find more than you think that you're hunting for.